a radiation oncologist and I have to be honest and say that ocular melanoma, as it's a rare disease, I don't treat a lot of people, but over the last 15 years or so since John first rang me up and said, can you treat this patient for me, I've become quite interested in this very interesting disease and technically it's been a challenge for us to come up with something which we're now pretty happy with. Um, I'm going to skip over a bit the bracky stuff that, Ma, uh, that John's obviously touched on and try to emphasise a little bit what we're doing with our external beam and then Peter is going to follow on about protons in a bit more detail as well. So I suppose that I will try to cover what is radiation therapy, why do we bother about doing it and then a little bit about our Australian context. So you've heard already about plaques. The radiation, it's actually a really old therapy for cancer in general and it's evolved in the first half of the 20th century, it evolved in parallel with surgery and ophthalmology is a very unusual medical practice because it was the surgeons who were doing the radiation and in most areas of, of oncology that hasn't been the case. Um, and so radiation oncologists in this country haven't had a huge amount to do with the, control of the treatment of the disease until more recently when we started using linear accelerators. They might have been in the background with the plaque but really it's been the surgeons and the physicists who've been managing the most of the, the therapy. Anyway, plaque as you've heard from John is sort of low energy. Uh, gamma, knife, uh, gamma rays from the cobalt, but um, beta particles out of the ruthenium plaque, which don't penetrate very deeply into the eye and are very nice in that regard. So linear accelerators, which are the workhorse of cancer care outside the eye, so breast cancer, we've heard alluded to today by Glenn, and lung, prostate, all these things you'll have heard about in the community are mostly treated on this sort of a machine. And the way that any radiation works is, is to interact with what's called the DNA. You've probably heard about that. DNA carries all these genes and then non-coding gene information which helps to modulate those genes. And it's like a computer program that runs the cell. Cancers are cancers because their computer program's not working properly anymore. And that actually is something that we can exploit with radiation because the radiation energy comes into the cell, often it's interacting with, mo with molecules and mediated by water to ionise this DNA, or it might be that it, this ejects an electron directly, interacts with it, or with protons. I haven't got a diagram here, but the, the, um, the energy that is created comes kind of blasting through here and makes rather more of a mess. Um, anyway, any, whatever is happening with this energy, the energy from the radiation interferes with the chemistry of the cell and the DNA, makes more injury in the cell so that often it's not immediately, it might be after two or three divisions and maybe even five divisions, eventually that DNA is so abnormal that the cell dies. And normal cells are much better at dealing with that kind of injury because their DNA repair systems are working properly so they're more able to, to cope with radiation injury if we allow the cell to do that and that's what we've spent the last hundred years as radiation oncologists trying to understand how to give radiation safely to exploit this, this um, ability to kill cells, both normal and abnormal. More recently there's been a lot of interest in radiation interaction with the immune system. Immunotherapy is obviously very relevant to the skin melanoma population and it's quite clear when I treat uh, brain metastases with patients who are on immunotherapy that there's something happening with radiation that didn't used to happen before. But we don't know a huge amount about it really, particularly not in the eye I wouldn't say. Um, there's, there's no doubt that radiation and immune therapy interact with each other so it's, we say that radiation upregulates the immune system. The immune system seems to help enhance radiation efficacy as well and I, I really wonder if this kind of toxic eye syndrome that Bertel has described as occurring after high dose proton beam therapy is probably mediated by the immune system like a chronic inflammatory problem in the eye. Peter's going to go to this in further detail but basically we think about the energy of an x-ray beam as being something that comes into the body, builds up, you get this maximum point of energy deposition and then a fade away so you all know that x-rays go deeply into things and you need six centimetres of lead to stop the average high energy radiation beam. Protons do something quite differently, they build up their dose and then suddenly just deposit it, boom, and then it's all gone. And that's been very useful in lots of areas of cancer to stop delivering dose beyond where the beam has finished. The tricky thing with protons is that they're much harder to, crop, to control, in, in, in the sort of harder to handle, and that's made them um, more complicated to deliver. And in, they're also extremely expensive, so we don't currently have a proton facility in Australia, although we're soon to have one up in, uh, running in Adelaide, and there's a discussion around whether we have an I-beam line or not, and Peter will talk about that later. So you've heard a bit about the history of BRACI. Protons started to be used initially in the US, um, I think was the first department, but Brett Bristol can, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but really they were linked to research facilities where proton beams were being studied for all sorts of other reasons, a bit like we have the synchrotron in Melbourne currently, which does all sorts of imaging and science, and on the end they tacked on a little bit of treatment. Um, and then perhaps more in more modern communities we, get, we start to get more clinical situations so you not feel like you're sitting in a research machine. Um, and these departments here have got huge experience treating 
thousands of patients with eye melanoma with very good results. And then the use of stereotactic radiation really came about in Australia because of the COM study that John alluded to, showing that perhaps the, be the best evidence that was available, that it was very reasonable to try to preserve your eye if at all possible. And so we started to work out how we were going to do that in the early 2000s, in the mid-1990s it was done in Europe, um, and a department in Sydney and in, in um, Dunedin are also doing the same. Um, so I won't bother about plaque because John talked about that. Protons I won't spend a great deal of detail on because Peter will tell you a little bit more, but the, the system that's used is the same as it's been used for 40 years, 50 years. It's very simple, although as I said, it's hard to do well. And it requires a close relationship between the ophthalmologist and the radiation oncologist so that things, people understand where the tumour is. It's still a surgical procedure to put in these little clips to define the location of the tumour. Plain x-rays are done to localise that within a planning system. And then the beam energy um, is designed to deliver the dose to here and ideally to stop before you get to anything else. So the, the, the use of protons is really very different from LINAC. So pro, in protons, as you can see, there's this quite, um, I don't know, confronting looking wheel that the patient has to look at, whatever system is designed to hold the head very still. And then in the planning process, it's worked out where the patient's going to gaze, up, down, sideways, whatever, to get the front of the eye out of the way and to make the tumour as accessible as possible for this one beam line which will come at the patient. Um, and then when they come to have treatment, they look at this little thing and it doesn't take very long, you know, maybe 10 minutes, five minutes, very short time to give the beam. Um, and they'll come for four or five times in a row, in a week, depending on the department that's treating them. So some departments give five treatments, other departments do one day of measurement and four treatments. Um, and uh, that's probably all I need to say about that at the moment. When we did, started using stereotactic radio, radiotherapy, as I said, initially in Europe, we pretty much adopted what they do, and this is what we're doing currently. We've got a, a pretty whiz-bang linear accelerator, which is called a, a stereotactic linear accelerator, and it's dedicated to treat small things, classically in the brain, um, which is what this mask system was developed for. Once upon a time, patients used to have to have a frame screwed into their head, which would hold their head very, very still on the couch, and that enabled us to blast very little things with a very high dose of radiation in a way that wouldn't be safe if you didn't have that very immobilised head. And also MRI scanning has enabled us to localise very, very small things very accurately. So this kind of system for brain tumours gives you one millimetre accuracy. The gamma knife that John was alluding to is an older technology which gives even less than one millimetre, 0.17 millimetre accuracy. There are some in Australia at the moment that are used for, for um, other treatments but not for eye treatment at the moment. If you look up here, this lady lying here looking up, we'll see this and you can see these little tiny bits of metal. The very smallest ones are only 2.5 millimetres. They're called multi-leaf collimators and each, this whole system is a multi-leaf collimator. Each little bit of metal can move by itself so that you can shape around whatever it is that you want. And those little things can even move whilst the beam's aiming at the tumour to keep shaping to match exactly what you're treating. In order to make sure we have the eye still, because the eye could wobble around all over the place, we've adopted this system which was first used in Vienna where there's a, a camera with a light. We've got a mirror here just so it's not quite so on top of the person's face to make it easy for them to gaze at. And then we can, oh, sorry, I don't think I've lost my picture of the eyeball. Here we go. We can monitor the iris as a simple way to ensure that the eye is staying still during the treatment, initially with measurements and then when the beam is actually being delivered. We've decided that um, MR, you can see there's really quite a small tumour here. It's, if, if we use what's called an, an orbit coil, so I don't know if you've ever had an MRI scan, it's not the most pleasant of scans in the world, they're very noisy, somewhat claustrophobic, and the eye coil is even more claustrophobic because it's very close to you, but it gives very high resolution images just of that one orbit. Even the other side you can see is a bit fuzzy. And we, we use that setup with the eye tracker in the MRI scanner so that then when we take the MRI picture and the CT, I should say, sorry, the patient has the mask made with the eye tracker and a CT at measurements, and because the, the planning system, the software that calculates the radiation, needs to talk to a CT scan. We don't have systems that are very well developed yet for talking to MRI scans. So we take the MRI picture and the CT and plonk them on top of each other. And the accuracy of that match really is critical to how successfully you're targeting what you think you're targeting on the CT. And so this system has enabled us to do that really beautifully and we get the optic nerve matching perfectly, the little tumours match perfectly. Occasionally a person's a bit tired when they have that measurement done or they just find it a bit freaky or they can't quite see well enough and their eye might wobble a little bit and then we just make a tiny bit, bit more margin to allow for that error potentially in the setup. But essentially we get extremely stable eye positioning. Um, we've tested it and we've, in about 12 patients, just systematically in a row when we, when we updated to this system and it was 0.2 millimetre movement or something of, um, of what we 
calculated mathematically, I should say the physicists calculated mathematically, was the tumour movement at the back of the eye. And then you've seen some of these pictures from John before, so I don't know how well that projects. You can see this is the little red outline there is the tumour, and then we put on what we call a margin to give us a planning target volume. In radiation oncology, it's all about defining our target, defining the structures that we don't want to hurt, and then coming up with a plan that's going to aim at the target as well as possible and minimise dose to the things that we don't want dose on. Um, and so you can see in this, this plan here, the, the, the target dose is aimed around the blue, and then we have this fall away. So this will be, a, this will be the treatment dose, this will be about half of that dose, and this will be about a tenth of that dose. So the dose is spread moderately around the, the body, but the high dose that's going to cause any major morbidity is cent centred at the, the back of the tumour. Now, the trouble with radiation is it's not really a good thing to give eyes, realistically. It causes toxicity, and I'm sure you've all been very well aware of that since your diagnosis. Um, in eye melanoma, we've got a mixture of things happening. So we've got this very historic use of plaque and protons with doses that, in that era, were really worked out clinically. People haven't been able to study and said, oh, this is the right dose. But that happens in a lot of cancers. You know, we've, we've evolved in the first half of the 20th century certain understandings about what's safe to give the body and what tumours tend to respond to. And then the second half of the 20th century, there was a lot of work done in radiation oncology, testing different regimens to try to understand what was a good idea. That was quite easy to do in diseases that are common, but it's not very easy to do in a disease that's very rare, and it's not really been done. So we know that the doses that are classically given, certainly with proton beam and, and even with plaque, overwhelm the normal capacity of the tissues to receive those radiation doses. So it's not surprising that you get very significant toxicity if you give those doses. Um, the, the front of the eye is very sensitive to radiation. The epithelial tissues don't like being irradiated. And if you get ulceration, it's very painful. If you get fibrosis through here, you can cause glaucoma or vascular injury. The, the brain, the eye thinks it needs more blood vessels and it makes more blood vessels that it doesn't really need. And obviously, if you blast the nerve and the nerve's dead, you can't see anything. And if you damage the retina, like people with diabetes or people who've got high blood pressure, you can get an illness of the blood vessels called retinopathy, which the ophthalmologists spend a lot of their life managing. And that leaking and bleeding and other consequences of having retinopathy also contribute to vision loss. So it's not an easy place for a radiation oncologist to be, to be honest. Um, and cataract doesn't take much radiation at all to induce a cataract. Most Australians, by the time they're 70, have a cataract. But if you've had radiation to the eye, even if you've only had a few grey through there, you'll almost certainly get it decades younger than if you didn't have the radiation to your eye. Fortunately, our ophthalmologic colleagues can deal with that fairly readily. High dose radiation, if it causes bad side effects, could be a reason to have your eye out. So sometimes people will be counselled if they've got a very large lesion or one that's really just so likely to cause morbidity in the eye that it'll be painful and unpleasant to really not consider radiation. It's probably in your interest to not do that at all. Um, but I'll, I'll usually we'll try to treat something where we think it's a reasonable chance of controlling the tumour without harming the eye such that you have to have it removed. I've just made a little table here to try to simply, it's very simple, state a little bit of con contrasting the, the different techniques. So both the plaque and protons, you'll need to have some sort of an operation. With the stereotactic, the external beam treatments, you don't need to have an operation. The problem with the plaque is it's really tricky to get sufficient dose over a tum into a tumour that's sitting over the optic nerve. So the, the notch plaques that John alluded to will help with that, but it is a risk factor for progression if you've treated with a, a plaque at the posterior eye. People who are very skilled can use plaque to treat these very anterior lesions as John was alluding to, um, it's, and, and I think plaque is a good treatment for the very front of the eye if people know what they're doing with it, and that, um, similarly with protons. Flat lesions are very hard to see on an MRI, even if you've got our very high resolution. I won't skip back to the picture, but you can imagine if it doesn't have any thickness, I don't know where it is. Um, and I'm sure that some of the people that I've, tr I've tried to treat their eyes so that they don't have to have a nucleation and it's grown, it's because I've missed it. It's really not a great thing, so I'm starting to change my practice there and say, I don't think I should treat you. Um, and the toxicities of, so plaque, it's a little bit uncomfortable to have the procedure done, perhaps a little bit confronting to think about it, but in the end, the toxicities are pretty mild, I think. You can get the, 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 the very high doses delivered are just over a three to five day period. The, the um, retina can swell, you get what we call edema, and the ophthalmologists keep an eye on that. It make your vision go a bit off. This ocular motor muscles, if they, don't quite work as well as they used to when, you get, when they get sutured back again, that might be annoying and you get some double vision, but it's not common for that to be a significant problem. And for the community, the cost I would say is moderate low. The plaques you've heard, they cost $20,000, $30,000 for a year, but that'll treat you know, 60 or 80 people. 
um, it's not actually very much at all for cancer treatment when you think about the thousands and thousands of dollars that are spent on drugs or um, even to buy a linear accelerator. Protons, unfortunately, are very expensive, and we'll talk about that later. The difference with protons is that they can cause acute toxicity at the front of the eye because the beam's coming through the front and the dose is higher at the front. So getting a dry or irritating uh, uh, cosmetic changes is more likely with protons. It's not going to happen at all with, with photons that we use at the back of the eye. But as I said, we're really not very good at treating something that's flat and I would not treat an anterior tumour because I know I'm going to cause bad pain, bad problems, and it would be um, inadvisable to do that. Um, and the cost, it's hard to evaluate. So the linear accelerator we've already got as a workhorse for treating cancer and then we need to adapt with some specialised technology to enable us to treat eye tumours, but um, it's probably in the moderate low cost too if you put it in the big picture of cancer care. So why are we bothering with radiation if I don't like irradiating eyes? And I think it comes down to patient choice. People don't like the idea of having their eye taken out. And any opportunity to keep their eye is often what people want. Even though I say them, I'm often getting referred patients whose tumours sit right over their macula and or their optic nerve, and I know that they will go blind from the treatment. And I say, you're going to lose your vision. It'll take three to five years, but it will happen. But I'd still like to keep my eye, thanks. I'm, I'm going to go for it. So that's, I think that's a perfectly reasonable choice, but the main, really the main reason is eye preservation with the goal of vision preservation if you can, but that is going to depend whereabouts in the eye it is. Um, and as we've heard before, there's apparently no reduction in survival if you decide to keep your eye um, compared to having it enucleated. Um, I'll just do a little bit. So dose in, in, um, in radiation I alluded to is not very well studied. I'm conducting a small trial to see if we can use small radiation doses like we do in other parts of the body to protect the vision outcomes of the eye. It's too early to know whether we're successful or not. Dose for dose, the published results here are all that seem to be too good to be true. And certainly if it's a very big tumour, um, I've probably not made this very clear here, sorry. There's a couple of series, one published by Max here, <laughs> who reviewed some of the outcomes of very, very big tumours, nasty, difficult ones treated with protons at the US, US department. It's harder to control those tumours, it's not surprising, and you're much more likely to get substantial toxicity. So um, it's not quite as rosy as this, but for small, the more commonly found lesions in our community, small lesions, you're very likely to get control with radiation wherever it is in the eye, um, but the, the, tr the trade-offs are the morbidity of vision loss in particular. <laughs>